22 minutes before 8 o'clock here on Morning Live. Now, the book Enemy of the People has been described by former public protector advocate Tulima Donsela as a remarkable, well-researched and a must-read for anyone that's interested in evidence of state capture and getting South Africa back on track. The book puts a spotlight on, amongst other things, uh, the country under the leadership of President Jacob Zuma, the ANC's Polokwane Conference and State Capture. The authors Adrian Basson and Peter Titoi joins us to talk to us more about this book that's been launched officially today. Good morning to you gentlemen. Thank you so much for coming through. Hello, Palisa. Thanks morning, for Morning, It's a busy morning for us journalists this morning. <laughs> yes. But let's just take time out to talk about something different from Zimbabwe, of course, uh, the book. Um, and it comes at a time when we've seen so many books coming out focusing on President Jacob Zuma, even your previous one that's titled Zuma Exposed. Mm -hmm. How is the enemy of the people different from others? Look, I think, Palissa, what we tried to do was really to take a, a big picture look at the past 10 years under President Zuma's rule. Um, you know, state capture is very much a popular phrase in our country now, but it didn't just happen one day. It had a long start, you know, from 2007 Polokwane Conference, people coming into the ANC, what we argue the capture of the ANC by Zuma and his allies, to then institutional capture where um, Zuma put specific people in state institutions, including the SABC as well, and there we, we in the eventually opened up uh, you know, the, 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 the state for state capture by Zuma's uh, family and the Guptas. Um, but then we also have a big focus in the book on, on the fight back, um, on the people who fight back and stood up and said no, no more, including at the state broadcast. You know, we've seen a massive turnaround in the past few months. We've seen, uh, you know, the removal of, of Mr. Claudio Motsuning, the former COO. So, you know, we also have positives in the book where we say that the people of South Africa didn't just, uh, you know, stand by. Mm. They actually did something. Yeah. And, and, and the book, really, I, I had to stay up at night and read the book and finish <laughs> it. In terms of state capture, it, it talks about state capture from way back. It's not a phenomenon that's, that was just unleashed by a public protector because it also talks about the Gupta brothers having said that as soon as uh, President Jacob Zuma take that particular mm. chair, things will look all right for us. In, in hindsight, it's, 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 it, and, and the former Minister of Finance has implored us to connect the dots. Uh, he said that on a number of times. And looking back in hindsight, you know, you can trace it back very far. And I think if, if we knew what we know now, uh, in, in 2009, when the President took the oath of office uh, in May of 2009, we would have approached things differently as South Africans, as the media, mm -hmm. as civil society. Um, it's been a long-term project for the president. It's, it came to fruition the last couple of years, um, and I think civil society played a massive role. Uh, Adrian referred to the fight back, um, and, and the media and civil society played a massive role in exposing that, in, in, in educating South Africans and showing them what is going on and what happened. So, yes, it, it did have a long build-up, and it was a, a long-term plan by the president looking back now. And the first chapter of the book, uh, The Coalition of the Wounded, it, it really focused a lot on uh, the ANC's Polokwane Conference back in 2007. Mm. Why was this time significant for, for South Africa and how the country moved forward afterwards? Well, what's interesting, Palisa, of course, if you look back now, the people who were by Jacob Zuma's side with people like Julius Malema, Zulin Zima, Vavi, Blade, Blade Dimandi, who've all turned against the president now. They are, have either been fired by the president, have started their own political parties or trade unions. Um, there was a moment in the country's history when uh, President Thabo Mbeki, former President Mbeki, became very unpopular in the ANC. You'll remember there's this crowd of people who gathered around Zuma, um, probably not because they liked Zuma in the first place, but because they were really anti Mbeki. They felt like their voices were being silenced. They felt like economic policy was moving very new liberal, that the trade unions and the communists no longer had a say. They thought Zuma was going to be the champion of the workers, the communists um, and the trade unions, which just simply didn't happen. Um, President Zuma during his term tried to amass wealth, uh, tried to, to neuter the state criminal justice system to stay out of court and out of prison. Um, so we, we start there. I think you have to start there to see how this thing happened, why Zuma came in, why he was elected. A lot of these people have since, like, uh, you know, like Julius Malema, have since apologized uh, for, for bringing Zuma as president. And we're seeing, I think, the, the, the fallout of that happening now, even within the ruling party, as we go towards December. Yeah, and we're living in the times of fake news that is mainly used to uh, manipulate the political situation in South Africa. How did you make sure this, that this book is factually correct? I know you guys are journalists, so that's the most important thing. It's, it's, uh, I, look, uh, we, we were very privileged to, be, to, be, to have front row seats to history unfolding ever since Paul mm -hmm. in 2007, uh, the president's election in 2009, the, the, the national election in 2014, you know, everything that's happened since. So, so as reporters, as part of our job, you know, we try to keep ourselves to, to, to journalistic ethics. We try to, to, to stay as fair as we can. You know, there's, there's a big debate around 
around journalistic objectivity. That, that will never probably always be 100%. Uh, but we try to re remain factually true to events as we saw them and as we experienced it. And I think the, 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 the one unique thing about the book, or the one thing that we're very proud of both, I think, is the fact that most of all of the things that we write about, we actually experienced firsthand, you know. Mm. So it, 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 there was a lot of research, obviously, that went into the book, a lot of interviews that we did. But most of the events that we speak about, we, we experienced firsthand. And how long and we did you take you guys of. to compile this book? <laughs> so ever since Polokwane 2007, I think. Yeah, you know, yeah. it's, it's, it's something that's been in the back of our minds for a long time. Uh, because as I, as I was reading yeah. the book, I could identify with some of the things that yeah. are written here. I could actually tell that I actually read some of the articles that you two have written about yeah. these issues. So can you also say that it's perhaps a compilation of, of some of the articles that were published? I think, yeah, it's, it's not a compilation of the articles. What it is, is, you know, South Africans sometimes, you know, we are... Breaking news uh, mad. So, you know, every minute there's breaking news, there's more stories being bombarded. And what we did here, and it, the book gave us a chance to step a bit back from the breaking news and to connect the dots throughout state institutions, throughout, um, uh, you know, President Zuma's mm -hmm. State of the Nation address, for example, where he for the first time introduced um, massive expenditure on rail at Transnet and bring that story right through um, to, to the bribes that were paid. Uh, to Gupta companies in Hong Kong by the Chinese uh, manufacturer who manufactured those, those carriages for Transnet in the end. So, um, you know, it's definitely not a compilation of news articles. It's a narrative. It's a story that connects the dots from, from, the, from the ANC to the state institutions to ultimately state capture. Yeah, carriages that are still cannot be yeah. used. And we had Minister of <laughs> Transport yesterday saying mm -hmm. that they are just seated there. You wanted to add and on that? If, if I may add to that, you know, uh, Adrian's right. We, we work in a very highly charged news environment. I mean, I think we're expecting any moment here to be interrupted by your executive producer <laughs> saying what's happening in Zimbabwe. Yeah. So, so we work at a very high pace in the news industry, like you very well know. So, mm -hmm. so the book was an opportunity to take a step back and, and fill in the blanks, you know. So, so one, one, one blank that I really enjoyed doing was, was talking and, and writing about the firing of Ntlantla Nene, the former DG telling me, you know, he was driving back uh, from his offices at National Treasury on a, on, a, on, a, on, a, on, a, on a humid and a warm early evening in Pretoria when he got a text message from the Minister of Finance saying the axe has fallen. You know, it's, it's that type of detail that I think yeah. that, that, that won't ever find its way into a news report, but which, which works very well yeah. in a book. And it, it colors in the story and it tells the, it tells the narrative and it tells the yeah, story. Yeah, and you also tapped a little on his personal life here because you wrote extensively about uh, the links between reports that the president was being poisoned and a possible nuclear deal with Russia. Why was this Significant. Well, I think it's very significant if you look at the haste that President Zuma has to push through the nuclear deal. He's not shy about it. He says it. Um, he's, he's the recent appointment of David Mahlobo, the Minister of Intelligence, as Minister of, of Energy. Now, what's again interesting, if you connect the dots, is that President Zuma in 2014, when he was allegedly poisoned, went to Russia to be treated. He went to, went to not only to, to Russia, the country, he went to President Vladimir Putin's house. Not the Kremlin, but to his house. Mm. And he only took with him Minister David Mahlobo, the minister, then Minister of Intelligence. Um, according to our sources, what we, what we write about in the book is that President Zuma apparently got new blood yeah. from Putin. He thanks him for saving his life. And that apparently at that meeting, he already committed to buying nuclear, which, which I do think gives new perspective on why he's pushing it through so hard. Gentlemen, we have to live it at that due to time constraints. In fact, there's so much to talk about, but we don't have enough time. Thank you so much for coming through. Thanks, Melissa. Big day. Thank you so much. Well, let's take a quick ad break. You're on Morning Live 15 minutes before 8 o'clock stationed.